Goedenavond en waar welkom bij vanavond op programma. Het was lekker om een paar interessante dagen in Calidon door te brengen, waar leden van die Overberg bewaringsgroep en boeren in die omgeving bezig is met een blauw kraan voor census. Die mensen daar doen nogal baie goede werk. Ons wijs voor je daai programma een beetje later. Vanavond op 50.50. Let's find out from Florence Masebe, a television presenter turned actress, the new star on Generations 3, what she thinks of the Lions. Brugge aan zijn goede reen is ons dag voor dag daar weg, berg op. Die wit komberg waar die kruin wegsteek was dalk een bedekte zien. Kwazulu Natal is facing its greatest land use transformation yet. The rapid growth of exotic timber plantations in this region has sounded many alarm bells. Recently, a forestry in Daba was held in Peter Maritzburg to discuss this growing phenomenon. Minister of Water Affairs Kader Asmal explains why it came about. This conference that we held on afforestation is part of the attempt of the democratic government to involve as many people as possible in decision making. But for the, for the next few years, with 15, 16 million people not having water, uh, this can't be left to the whims and fancies of, of local power groups. Of all the provinces, KwaZulu Natal has the most potential for timber expansion, especially in the higher rainfall regions bordering the Drakensberg Mountains. This used to be prime beef country, but stock farming in this region is now under threat as a result of the high crime from neighboring communities. It is in this region that the government deals with a mass of permit applications every year to plant more exotic trees, such as pine and blue gum. Forestry is a highly profitable form of land use, more so than stock or game farming, but the dramatic transformation of vast tracts of rich fire climax grasslands to a sea of trees is a great worry for conservationists. Farmers, quick to recognize its long-term economic benefits, want to know whether the timber giants will swamp their efforts. What we feel is that um, the longer the process of getting permits is drawn out, the more it cancels out normal farmers who would like to plant some of their farm to timber. Because, for instance, happened this year, guys who applied a year ago haven't got the permit yet, so they've lost this whole growing season. Now, Sapi or Mondi or the big timber companies can finance that time span, but a farmer can't. So it actually drives out the smaller producers in favor of the bigger producers. Other communities, also threatened by creeping plantations, were invited to express their opinions on land use in their province. Let me say, if the whole of Natal was sugarcane and forestry, would that be de development, really? We, we could contribute maybe um, 20 billion to the whatever national product they, they, they talk of. But is that comprehensive development of the people of Natal? The minister also expressed the government's opinion. The protection of the environment is not a middle class white or, or environmental group's uh, concern. One of the striking things in the last two years is how ordinary rural people now are saying, the environment belongs to us too, and we need to participate. And particularly if there are traditional ties that you and I may not have to the land, we have to take that into account. South Africa has lost a number of species over the past two centuries. Three of those species used to roam the wide open spaces of the Karoo. The magnificent blue buck in the painting behind me was one of them. The quacha, of course, was another. And yet another, the Cape Lion. Now, recently it was reported that the Cape Lion might not be extinct at all. Find out more after the break. Eerst net 140 beddens per week gemaakt. Nu maken ons 1500 elke skof. Volkskas Bank is begrip van die internationale markt en ons uitvoeren laat groeien. <laughs> Volkskas en het eten een pad gegaan om mee bezig te bestaan. Dus zo zijn we goede vernoten. Mijn eerste kunstacademie was goud te klein en ons moest een groter plek bouwen. Hier was mijn visie en die bank het gefinancierd. 
Hulle kom juist gesels vandag oor die uitbreiding van die ateliers. Take a good look through Transitions Lenses, the lightweight plastic prescription lenses with a special tint that lightens and darkens as the light changes. Lightweight plastic lenses that darken and lighten just like that. It's comfort you can see day or night, outside or inside. Ask for Transitions Lenses and see for yourself. Moet jij a pakkie stuur? Dank geel! Geel blad, sê jou. Dreams kiss my eyes Stormy winds sing lullabies In a cloud Ons is al so lang in die gang oor geraas en vibratie vermindering in die Toyota Camry. Dit lyk op partijmese aan die slaap geraak het. Try candle scents from Glade. Oh, warm the glow. Lift my spirits, take it slow. Inviting peach, vanilla, and country garden. Light up candle scents from Glade. Fresh from Glade. Cryptozoology is the study of evidence or reports that indicate that an extinct species may in fact still be alive. There have been a number of cases around the world involving birds in New Zealand, antelope in South Asia, and certain feinbos species. Now recently, there's been another case of cryptozoology, that of the Cape lion, thought to have gone extinct in South Africa in about 1836. Of all the wildlife in our national parks and game reserves, the animal which arguably most people want to see is the lion. Perhaps the excitement we get from seeing them stems from the days when our ancestors were predators just like them. Or perhaps our fascination for them comes from the fact that they sometimes ate us in the past. about two and a half thousand lions in South Africa today, all of them confined to fenced off or protected areas. In Botswana and Namibia, some still roam free. Zoologists refer to them in scientific jargon simply as Panthera leo. No living subspecies are recognized. In days gone by, when lions ranged throughout the subcontinent, early zoologists divided them into a number of subspecies. In the Kalahari, there was Panthera leo venae. Its territory stretched from the Northern Cape to Angola. There was Panthera leo krugeri in the Kruger Park and Mozambique. In the Orange Free State and the Karoo, there was the Cape Lion, known in the scientific jargon as Panthera leo melanochitis. Described in 1842 by Charles Hamilton Smith, the Cape Lion is still regarded in some circles as having been a subspecies of the lion. Smith was, however, too late with his description because one of the last Cape lions in the country was shot on the Bontebok Flats just north of Colesburg in 1836. They went extinct shortly afterwards, having lost the relentless battle against humans advancing into the hinterland. In 1706, on the slopes above Somerset West, Andries van der Stel had to explain to the Dutch East India Company why he was taking so long to establish Vergelegen Wine Estate. 
he sent some etchings to Holland to show why. Cape Lions were holding up the operations. Today, the only records we have of the Cape Lion in South Africa are a few paintings of the animal done by the early hunter naturalists. There are also three skulls in the South African Museum in Cape Town and another in the Port Elizabeth Museum. They're a sad indictment of the respect our forefathers had for our country's natural heritage. A number of stuffed Cape Lion specimens exist in museums overseas. The one shot in Colesburg in 1836 is in London, in the Supplementary Services Division of the British Natural History Museum. Among the skeletons that have been taken off public display stands the last specimen of the animal that reigned over the interior of our country prior to the arrival of the European settlers. Another specimen is in the Leiden Natural History Museum in the Netherlands. This one became uh, into the possession of this museum in 1860, and it, before that it was part of the University uh, of Leiden collection. And that was donated or changed with another collection of the museum in 1860, 1861. And in that year, this lion became our property. But there was no documentation accompanying it, so we do not know when it was shot, when it was mounted, and where it came from, unfortunately. Five other specimens are in Amsterdam, Wiesbaden, Stuttgart, and Paris. A number of skulls are also in collections elsewhere in Europe. The Cape Lion was separated from other lions on the subcontinent because of its physical characteristics. It was apparently bigger than other lions. It had peculiar dark markings on its feet, which other lions apparently do not have. And most importantly, its mane was extremely large, extending all the way under the belly to the groin. Comparing its mane to lions in the Kalahari, northern Botswana, and the Kruger National Park, it's clear how much bigger the Cape Lion's mane was. In the 1970s, a Czechoslovakian researcher who studied nearly 300 lion skulls in museums around the world was also convinced that the Cape Lion was a separate subspecies because it was the only lion with a fully developed second lower premolar. Although early hunters and museum collectors were no doubt about the Cape Lion's unique features, there is now debate as to whether it was a subspecies. Whether the Cape Lion is more distinguished than other lion types, to me it seems a bit questionable. It's more likely that you would find geographic races or subdivisions of a species in animal groups that are more sedentary. So in the case of the lion, I would think that because of their social structure that, and their, their ability to cover large areas, that they probably represent one large gene pool with probably not too much genetic structure between populations, even those that are separated by vast geographic distances. Either way, it's sad that these paltry museum specimens are the only evidence we have of the animal that has become synonymous with our game reserves and national parks. The scene changes to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, where Dr. Jaime Ebedes of the Honest Report Veterinary Research Institute was on a research trip last year. During his trip, he visited the zoo where he saw some lions. Spectacular ones. In all his years working in zoos, Dr. Ebedes had never seen anything like them. He felt he was looking at the extinct Cape Lion. On his return to South Africa, he showed this video to a few experts and they all agreed the Addis Ababa lions bore a striking resemblance to the animal that walked our shores 150 years ago. But how accurate is it to make assumptions on an animal's origin based on its appearance only? The Natal Lion Park had a lion with an impressive mane in the 1970s. There was another one in a private collection in the Cape at about the same time. Kapama, a private game reserve near the Kruger National Park recently acquired a number of Barbary lions, which had been abandoned by a circus in Mozambique. Like the Cape lion, the male's manes also extend to the groin. 
The Barbary lion was a North African lion that was shot to extinction in the wild in 1925. Today, it's only found in zoos, circuses, and museums. Some experts believe environmental factors cause the extra large mane. Some people would say in very thorny areas, uh, thorny bush areas, um, that lions would, it would be advantageous to the lions to have a shorter mane. Um, if you look at the lions in the Kalahari, uh, they've got these magnificent, magnificent big manes. Um, to the individual lion, um, as a male lion, I mean, he does use his mane when he's strutting. It's, it illustrates that he's the male. Um, they use it when they're courting with females. Um, also, the mane is incredibly important when it comes to when the males fight. Now, the majority of the, the wounds um, are inflicted on the neck and the face. And with this, this massive mane, it helps protect those vulnerable areas. The debate over the Addis Ababa lions raises the question, what constitutes a subspecies? About 15 years ago, the attention of conservationists was focused on the dry coacophilt of northern Namibia. It was thought that the elephants here might be a subspecies of the ordinary African elephant. Rumor had it that they were taller, had bigger feet, and were hardier than other elephants on the continent. A research project was undertaken, and the conclusion reached after DNA studies had been done was that the coacophilt elephants were all Loxodonta africana. Then there's the king cheetah, which for decades was thought to be a subspecies of the cheetah. Captive breeding programs eventually revealed, however, that it was simply a color variant of the cheetah, similar to that found in the domestic cat. For a long time after its extinction in 1883, the quacha was regarded by zoologists as a completely separate zebra species. This specimen is also in the Leiden Museum in the Netherlands. There is only one specimen of the quacha in South Africa, a foal in the South African Museum in Cape Town. Remounting the specimen a few years back, Reinhard Rao, the taxidermist at the museum, collected some muscle tissue from the skin and sent these off for DNA tests. From these, it was found that the quacha's DNA almost exactly matched that of the plain zebra. A selective breeding program was started, and today, Zebras with similar markings to the extinct quacha now roam five breeding areas in the Cape. We need more DNA uh, extracted and examined of a few quacha individuals. We so far have only the DNA extracted of one quacha individual, and that is not really enough to give a valid answer. So it is a debatable point still whether it is a species, was a species or a subspecies, but. We believe that it was a subspecies because all morphological characters absolutely point in this direction. One animal that is divided into subspecies is the rhino. There are three black and two white rhino subspecies. Recent research by Pretoria University, though, has indicated that this classification might have to be reviewed. What we did find is that the southern African race of black rhino contains a huge amount of genetic variation and that the Namibian race contains a small subset of the total amount of genetic variation within the southern populations. And this would suggest that the Namibian population is not a discreetly different group from that of the southern populations and that it is not really then a different subspecies in that sense. But the big question with the Addis Ababa lions is where did they come from? One rumor has it that they were from the personal collection of Emperor Haile Selassie, the Ethiopian dictator who was deposed in 1974. Although Selassie owned many lions, it's understood he was also given some by the King of England. The King's lions, in turn, might have come from the Dublin Zoo, and we know that their original breeding stock came from Natal in the 1850s. If this information were indeed correct, and providing that not too much inbreeding took place between the lions during the years spent in Dublin, then we may have discovered the last gene pool of the extinct Cape lion. As one can imagine, this would be great news for conservation and indeed a truly remarkable story. DNA testing will be the only really accurate way to tell if the Addis Ababa lions are related to the Cape lion or not. The medical school at the University of Cape Town has done a number of animal projects like this in recent years, so I went to see the experts. 
Apparently, there are two types of DNA testing that can be done. These are known as mitochondrial DNA sequencing and microsatellite analysis. But these would have to be done on a number of lions across the continent for any meaningful comparative results to be obtained. If you were to compare a lion and a tiger, you'd find the DNA sequences which we'd look at would be about um, 5% different when we compared one with the other. If you compared any two lions, say, from the Kruger Park, you'd probably find only a very small difference between them, say, half a percent. So what we'd be looking for is to see whether we got a difference between the lion specimens which were of the same amount of difference you find between the lion and the tiger. That would be really exciting because that would tell us that the uh, Barbary lion or the Cape lion were different species. The researchers might have a problem working with the ancient DNA in the museum specimens as it's sometimes affected by the tanning processes. The amount of crossbreeding the Addis Ababa lions have had over the years could also make the results inconclusive. But whatever the origin of the Addis Ababa lions, some people believe there will be a tourism benefit in having lions with the physical characteristics of the Cape lion re-established in South Africa. Kapama Game Reserve, which has run a successful predator breeding program for the past decade or so, have begun negotiating with the Ethiopian authorities to start a collaborative breeding project. Ons voorstel is dat die leeuws naar Zuid-Afrika gebring moet word en dat ons dan hier dit bly hulle leeuws, dit is dan op een leenbasis naar Zuid-Afrika toe. Al het voorgestel dat ons dit daar in Ethiopië moet doen. Maar ik ga glad niet daarmee samen. Ik voel dit moet in Zuid-Afrika gedoen, gedoen wordt. Want ons is een land wat bij bekend is voor ons wetenschappelijke navorsing. According to Kapama, negotiations to bring the Ethiopian lions to South Africa are at an advanced stage. But it'll be some time before they actually arrive. Only then can the DNA work begin. And like all other interested parties, we'll be watching very closely to see whether or not an extinct species will be brought back from the dead. Blijkbaar gaan die DNA toetsen binnen die volgende paar maanden, zelfs binnen een paar weken begin. Al ooit gehoor van een varswater garnaal boe op een berg. Johan Boote het gaan vaststel wat die natuurerfenisproject, wat nou al een hele paar jaar aan die gang is, behels. Als jouw bank jou niet verstaan in die groeifase van jouw bezigheid nie, skakel ons nou vir een afspraak by 0800 A lot of nice houses are really embarrassed about the state of their roofs. Yet there's such a simple, inexpensive answer. Plascon New Roof goes on all kinds of roofs beautifully. It's rain-resistant, UV-resistant, and long-lasting. Plascon New Roof removes the embarrassment. Because when you new roof your roof, you facelift your house. What's the best washing powder for twin tubs? I have a automatic washbasin with twin tubs. I have another washbasin with twin tubs. But I have always come back to the old micro. Because together with the old micro and with twin tubs, we make a span. A right wind span. I haven't the time to stand scrubbing collars and dirty marks, and I just put them in the twin tub with the Oma Micro and say, do your job, and it does its job. Look, this is a coffee stain washed in ordinary powder, and this is the same stain washed in an automatic powder. Just look how much more effective Omo Micro is in your twin tub. And the plonkies lost all up. That mark like a wit scheme. 
En my was gekom definitief baie mooi skoon. Dit is een oude boerenraad. Jy gebruik het en jy weet, dit is altijd een succes. Omo Micro. In twin tubs, it really is the strongest washing powder for the cleanest wash. President Mandela is the beschermer of the South African Nature Erfenis project, which 12 years ago started by the Department of Environment Sake. This project's oogmerk is to help to help with the private land to help with nature. The Adjunct Minister of Environment Sake and Tourism, Peter Mokaba, had in October, by a great deal of Midrand in Gauteng, certificates and bronze erfenis plaaktekens on 24 new deelnemers. The Department of Environment Sake is now still in the of the project, where under the name of the al 268 nature erfenis per se registered. Net om 6% van South Africa's ground is verklaarde staats wildtuine in nature gebiede. Adjunct Minister Mokaba hopes that the nature erfenis project, the beschermen of our land's nature op private ground, further will aanhel. As you can see, we didn't have enough of the other communities here. Mm -hmm. And it is quite important that we correct this situation in a hurry, that we should ensure that the people who still live very close to nature, like those in the rural areas, mustn't regret that type of life, but should actually take pride and that guide their development in such a way that it does not remove them away from, from nature. So we, we need to develop uh, a, a, a quite a, 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 a package of incentives to ensure that uh, people's behavior is changed towards the environment and that everybody has got the same definition of the environment. Peggy Pilliner, se plaas papillon, lê net buiten bronkos pruit. Dis een van die niet geregistreerde erfenis persele. Sy sê, sy was uit die staanspoor baie thuis hier. A rechterhand, Elias, bestuur die 66 hectare plaasie wanneer sy nie hier is nie. Peggy, how did you get involved in the whole project? Johan, it began about 1974 when Reg and I wanted to go camping and hiking over weekends. And um, unfortunately the petrol restrictions came in. Friday to Monday, no petrol. What could we do? And then Reg found the, an advert in the newspapers for weekenders, for plots for weekenders. And he said, Peg, won't you go and look at them? And I phoned my husband and I said, Reg, do you want um, a rockery to play with for the rest of your life? He said, yes, please. And my husband only saw it a week later. And we spent a whole year walking the area, feeling it, empathizing it. And so gradually a process of osmosis began, whereby we were captured by it. Een perceel moet eindelijk net aan een van vijf criteria voldoen om als een natuurerfenis gebied te kwalificeren. Daar moet skaars en uitzonderlijke plantgemeenschappen wees, of een unieke waterhabitat. Of dit moet deel wees van een sensitieve wateropvanggebied. Of dit moet die blijplek wees van een bedreigde diersoort. Of daar kan net zelfs een bijzondere mooi natuurtoneel op wees. Ik was niet verbaasd om te horen nie, dat in ons droe land twee van die vereistes iets te doen het met water. Papio voldoen aan al feit. Die blote feit dat er een vier hier doorloop is blijkbaar klaar genoeg rede. Maar dan is het boon op ook nog een opvanggebied. The river is part of the whole reason why this was declared a natural heritage site. Yes, this is correct. It's the Vilcher River catchment area and it's a sensitive area. And I can only agree with that because I've noticed increasing irrigation from it by increasing numbers of farmers. And it worries me because over the last 15 years, I've noticed the level of it drop steadily and quickly after the summer rains until you just get a riverbed with stones in it. And it's frightening to see this drop. Papillon's treffendste eigenskap is die kranse. In die alweine wat in rotskeure groei kwalificeer verder as speciale plantgemeenskappe. Hier is een baie algemene alweinsoor, maar alle alweine in Zuid-Afrika word door saaties beskerm en verskyn minstens op aanhangsel 2, wat beteken dat daar of beperk of glad nie met hulle handel gebruik mag word nie. Over here we've got the Isla Aberrations and here we've got a prickly pear which is an invader 
which I, in my new role as a natural heritage site, have got to eliminate. In any case, we would have worked at doing it. But we've got quite a few um, invaders, and it's going to take quite a few years of work to get them out of the way. Behalve for the alwijnen, come here ook andere besondere planten voor, zoals broodbomen en kippersolle. Planten, zoals die zeer oog, raak ook minder in die natuur. Dit is die oude verhaal van hoe meer mensen, hoe minder plek voor die natuur. Boerderij met monoculturen en oorbeweiding is van die omgeving zijn grootste bedreigings. This is a harebell, um, a diorama, a grasklokkie. And it dries beautifully and lasts for years as a dried flower arrangement. And then, I'm not quite sure of the name of this one, but I counted 27 varieties of grass. And that's apart from all the other types of species you do find in the grasslands. Here. Absolutely, it's a very, very rich variety of um, flora here. Op die grond is daar nie beeste of skape nie, net a paar wille diere. Die bruin hyena of strandwolf is een van die skaarser diere wat glo hier voorkom. En Elias is oortuig dat dit die mis is van die baie skuw dier. There's no nothing else, you see, this is... Isn't that a crabs, a bit of crabs from Kankrap. And that's the hyenas? Yes, his, 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 his droppings, right? Droppings. Yeah, it was a good find. Yes. Strandwolve is aasvreters. Net so 200 jaar terug was hulle nog so volop, dat hulle selfs tot in tafelbaai gesien is. Vandag is hulle uiters kaars. Hulle is baie skuw, en omdat hulle boon op nachtdieren is, sien die mens hulle maar min. Maar wat biedt ander natuurerfenis terreine? In die Noordoos Kaap leid daar twee van hulle sommer na by mekaar. Die Rush Valley Pan in die suidelike Drakensberge en die Prentjiesberg tussen Yogi en Mekleer. Die Pan, die berg en die plantaties behoort alles aan die pulpnijverheidsreus Mondi. Die dene boompies is nog jong, maar met der tyd, soos wat hulle groei en hoer word, sal die grasveld begin verdwijn. Dan zal het dichte dene naalde tapijt keer dat ander plantsoorte onder die bome groei. En so saam met die grasveld sal baie ander levensvorme ook verdwijn. Baie meer soorte plante groei in die berggrasveld boek aan die 1600 meter merk. En dis juis 160 hectare groot perseel van die berggebied waarvan die kern een pan is wat die erfenisterrein hier by Rush Valley vorm. Een belangrike rede vir bewaring was nog altyd dat baie van die plante, waarvan ons nie weet nie, nog moendlik oplossings kan bied vir ons medische en voedselvraagstukke. Net omtrend 5% van alle plante se medicinale eigenskappe is reeds bekend. En toch, voordat ons hulle nog behoorlik nagevors het, sterf daar bijna dagelik species uit. André Maré is Mondi's natuurbewaarder hier in die Noordoostka. Hy sien toe dat sensitieve gebiede nie toegeplant word met bome nie. Die pan is een uitstekende blijplek vir veral watervoels. Die bedreigde lel kraanvoel en die skaars geelbors koester maak onder andere hier nes. Die swartkop reier is een standvoel, maar hier is ook trekvoels. En die internationale Ramsar konventie wat door Zuid-Afrika ondersteun word, verplig ons verder om vleilande waar trekvoels oorblij voldoende te beskerm. Andrei sê die gebied sal onverstoord bly voortbestaan. Hier is 160 hectare wat geregistreer is en geen hectare van die gebied sal geplant word. Ook van die omliggende gebied wat aangekoop is, word nie meer as omtrend 60-65% geplant nie, so die rest bly in een natuurlijke toestand. Al het Mondi sy eie bewaringsbeamtes maak omgevingszaak is die deskundige soms ook hier het draai. Soos by al die ander erfenispersele, gee hulle hier ook advies en maak ter seller tyd seker dat het nog recht bestuur word. Terreine wat nie in stand gehou word nie, kan van die register afgehaal word. Dit het so ver al vijf keer gebeur. Registratie impliseer geen wetlike houvast dier die staat nie. Eienaars kan registratie na willekeur kanseleer. Nieuwe eienaars herregistreer dan ook dikwils een gebied weer self op hulle naam. Na die uitkoop van talle plaase vir die aanplanting van hulle commerciële plantaties, is Mondi nou feitlik die Prentjiesbergse alleen eienaar. Met die gras nog sop nat van die vorige aandse goeie reen, is ons douw voordag daar weg, berg op. Die wit kom bers vir die kruin wegsteek, was dalk een bedekte seen.
Die dene tegen die onderste hange van die berg stiet al vinnig op. Maar dit beteken dat die varings in die veldblomme wat nou nog oorals groei, binnenkort niet meer hier zal wees nie. What is this? Uh, this is a Watsonia. There are lots of them here. And you can see how the porcupine have been digging out the bulbs here. Now where they do that, the, the flakes of the bulbs will start growing and you get a whole cluster of these things growing together. If you consider that you've got a whole sort of balanced ecosystem on this mountain as it is, what sort of impact will the, the pine forest have in it? Well, in the pine forest, in the production areas, yes, there's going to be big changes, but we've got over 3,000 hectares for conservation set aside. WWF Suid-Afrika het in samenwerking met die private sector een ondersteuningsfonds begin. Elke jaar krijgt twee eienaars van terreinen financiële bijstand om bijvoorbeeld indringers uit te roei of om meinings op te zetten. Die departement van Omgevingszaken zal graag nog borgen willen wat kan helpen met speciale projecten. Hulle onderzoek ook die moeilijkheid van belastingtoegevings als een aansporingsmateriaal om grondeienaars financieel tegemoet te komen. Die niet tijd het ons bij die Dennebos uiters, het ons alles stevig in geklim. Die berg het nog steeds geheimzinnig onder zijn meskleed weggekruid. En Ricky was nu ook niet eindelijk bemoedigend nie. Johan, this is where the natural heritage site starts. You can see the fire break, just above those, uh, those cliffs. And you can't see the mountain yet because it's still hidden under, under cloud. But you'd be absolutely horrified if you did see it, because we've got a long way to go still. A little bit of indigenous forest there, and protea felt. You can see we've got three different kinds of protea here. Die groen strook is verlede winterse voorbrand. In die winter is hier dikwels veldbrande, en met die aanleef van die plantaties is die gevaar nog groter. Aan die andere kant, die zaad van die proteas wat hier groei, het vuur nou en dan nodig, anders zal hulle nie ontkiem nie. Maar te veel veldbrande en te warm vuren kan weer die planten in die sensitieve omgeving doodskroei. Ons pan besef gauw, dis nie een sommer so berg hierin nie. Die ander berge het al begin kleiner lyk. Saam met die moegheid, kom die rustigheid. Die uitzicht van hier boe is iets heel treffend. Die stilte wordt niet nou en dan door het trop op Jane verbreek. Die kansen begin beter lijkt dat ons niet die kruin en die mis hoef aan te pak nie, want die kranse het begin gesigwijk so nou en dan. Hier is daarom gelukkig ook een stafroute wat ons kon volg. Op die oomlik word net dagbezoekers toegelaat, maar Rikie hulle beplan het drie dag route met oornacht hutte, wat waarschijnlijk baie toeriste sal lok. San het per sele bly privaat eiendom en daarom moet voornemende voedslaanders eerst die eienaarse toestemming kry voordat hulle die terrein betree. Maar sommige terreine is so sensitief dat bezoekers glad nie daartoe gelaat kan word nie. Die einde is in sig, maar eerst moet ons maar weer een rukkie hokkaai om ons hortende asems in die dun lucht terug te kry. Vir die vereiste vir besondere esthetische eigenschappen verdien die Prentjiesberg ongetwijfeld volpunte. Maar daar is ook ander goeie redes waarom die berg een natuurerfenisgebied is. Dit is een belangrijke opvanggebied. Die grond werkt letterlijk soos een spons en oorhaal sy verstroompies uit die grond uit. Rikkie sê, een hele paar bergstrome ontstaan hier. Van die water cijfer ook dier na die ondergrondse watertafel. Hierdie massieve rotsformaties is oor duisende jare so dier wind en water uitgekerp. Die sandmense het ook hier tussen die kraanse en skeure gewoon. Daar is van hulle tekeninge oorals in die berg. Vandaar die naam, die Prentjiesberg. Dit is Johan. Look at that blesbak daar. And that is probably a Martin Reedback. Rooie Rook. This is actually new. You haven't seen this before. Now what happens here, these the little herders used to sleep here. And with the fires that they made, this was totally covered with soot. Uh, it must have been nine years ago that the herders were last year, because we took over about eight years ago. So the soot has now disappeared and they're visible again. 
but I'm so pleased to find these here because we've reintroduced Blaisbach into this area on the strength of the paintings of the Bushman paintings. And we're following that Martin Reedbuck we've brought back. We still want to bring back Elon. Die skitse lees soos een boek. Die wa beteken dat hulle relatief onlangs nog hier geblei het. Hier is een olifant in een jakkels of is het een hond? Prentjesberg, wat een gepaste naam. All I need to make me perfectly happy. Yeah. Ons moet nog net om die een rotsformatie klouter en oor die nek stap om tot boe te kom. Die einde is in sig, want hier boe is die eindelijke skat. Een baie unieke dierkie. Ek het al baie ver in my leven getrek achter garnale aan. Maar gewoonlik as een mens vast garnale soek en levendig is, dan gaan soek jylle by die see. Ek is nou so 2000 plus meter boekant see speel en ek soek garnale. Eers daarom weer net die ou asem terugkry. Daddy! Kebo! Dan die soeken na Riekiese fairy shrimps. Ek was nie seker precies waar na om te kyk nie. Die verskille tussen al die poele is opvallend. Die selfde plante en dierkies kom nie noodwendig in die poel langs aan voor nie. Here we go. You can see them swimming around in here. Hulle lyk heel te mal anders as wat ek verwacht het. Die skaaldierkie is een nieuwe specie wat Riekie hier op die berg ontdek het. Have a look there. They actually swim in the backs. The back swimmers, yes. Look at those colors, neon blues. Greens. Oh, wonderful. What do they actually eat? You see that they swim on their backs. And they've got all these little swimmerets, these pleopods. And they're collecting algae as they swim. The white on the tail, what, what is that? Those are the egg sacs. So they're pretty productive. Is there a way that you can actually tell males from females? Yes. By the egg sac? Or? By the egg sac, and the, the males have got a a well-developed antenna. Die mannikies is ook blijkbaar evens groener as die wijfies. What actually happens to them when, when these pools dry up? I mean, it snows in the mountain, you get, you get a lot of sun in summer. What actually happens to them? Well, these will dry up at the end of summer. The adults will then die. This is the amazing thing. These eggs can survive absolutely scorching sun. You know how it can get up here, particularly on the, on the rock surface and you know how cold it can get here. And here's this tiny little egg able to survive these incredible changes in temperature. That to me is so remarkable. Maar so will it die mense in vloed kon oorleef. Adjunct minister Mukawa het gesê, ons kan miskien wen as almal een nacht eners dink oor bewaring. Dit sal gebeur as meer mense begin siekies trap in die natuur, net soos wat die san gedoen het, wat lang voor ons geslag in die Brentjesberg gewoon het. As die omgeving gezond blij, dan sal het met ons ook goed gaan. En die sukses van die natuurerfenisproject is een maatstaf vir ons vordering op die pad voor en toe. Ek hoor die paaikie berg af, was ook maar lang en sikkel sikkel. Want die bewaring is nie net die staatse verantwoordelikheid nie. So, ons kalke gerust die departement van omgevingszake, as u ook een juweelkie op u grond het, wat kan kwalificeer vir registratie. Join Jeff Lockwood and the Bird Quiz after the break. difficult it can be for the small business person to get their message across. Look. But when you take advantage of SABC's admissions 50% discount for first-time advertisers, you can speak to your customers with a bigger voice and a bigger vision. For the manchiest 
freshest, best tasting mealies in town. Try Maisie's amazing mealies. Now, just up your street. With a 50% discount, everyone can afford to advertise on SABC TV and become successful. Phone admission now on OW1-714-6203. Why is it that as you grow older, life seems to become more boring? I mean, what a feeling. Your first paycheck and checking out your own flat. It was just so excellent, you know? And how totally awesome it was falling in love for the first time. I mean, it was so radical. And how hectic it felt when you first noticed girls and, like, their bodies and said, check the worry in my eyes. And before that, when you said things like, girls, eh, gross. And, wow, that a four times four. Cool, yee. The new permanent four-wheel drive Toyota RAV4. It's no toy, but that doesn't mean it won't make you feel like a kid all over again. <laughs> In keeping with golfing events the world over, Alfred Dunhill continues to create style and quality. Now, in that same spirit, we are proud to present the second annual Alfred Dunhill PGA Championship. Doctors and apothecaries do that. It's good to love you like I do, and to feel this way when I hear you say hello. En de winnaar van competitie nummer 22 is Elke Hofmeier van Randendal hier in Rodepoort. If you're the lucky winner, you receive a complete Sassel birding kit consisting of a coffee table book, a photographic guide, a field guide, a set of CDs on bird calls, a video and a pair of binoculars. Hi and welcome to Bird Quiz. From your entries it's clear that most of you are quite familiar with the birds of the Northern Cape and the drier parts up into Namibia. But if you did have some trouble, let's have a look at Guy Gibbons' video footage again. Ons eerste voel was die kaneelbosch sanger, or in English, cinnamon-breasted warbler. And if any of you have been lucky enough to see this bird, you'll realize that the footage we're showing you is very, very unusual. One's normal experience of this bird is of a mouse-like thing creeping around over the rocks in dry riverbeds in the drier parts of the country, the Karoo and further north. For our second bird, we gave you the clue that Guy Gibbon shot the footage in the Don Fulun Nature Reserve near Vintook in Namibia. And that combined with the beautiful video material that he sent us should have given you the rock runner or in Afrikaans, rotsvoel. It really has one of the most beautiful calls, so let's enjoy it for a few seconds. If you turn to page 329 of your Sassel Field Guide, you'll find our bird on the top left of that page. The rock runner is a Namibian endemic. It's found only in that country, and you find it on grassy hill slopes. Typically, the bird spends much of the day hidden in the grass, and it's only when it's calling, usually early in the morning or again late afternoon, and it sits up either on a rock or a low branch that you have a good chance of finding it and seeing it well. It's fairly similar to our own grass bird. Both birds have this characteristic moustachial stripe and streaking on the breast, and the grass bird also has a rather characteristic and attractive call.
Our third bird was the Track Track Chat or Fustain Speckfrieter. And if you turn to page 307 of your Sassel Field Guide, you'll find our bird in the middle of that page. We showed you a very pale form of the Track Track Chat, almost white in fact. And the only possible confusion could have come from the pale form of the Karoo Chat, a bird that occurs in the same habitat and in fact in the same area as well. In the chats, it's the tail pattern that's important. And our bird, the Track Track, has this characteristic combination of a white rump and a black upside down T on a white tail. Whereas the Karoo Chat just has these white edges to the outer tail. These are all the entries that have come into Bird Quiz over the last 11 months. We've kept them all and with representatives from Sassel and SABC, we drew the winner for that fantastic trip to Botswana. Birding in Botswana is an absolutely magical experience. It's exciting, the Delta is one of the most beautiful places on Earth and it's home to a number of really exciting and special birds. Birds like the Pearl's Fishing Owl, African Skimmer and Pink-Throated Longclaw. So the winners really got something special to look forward to. This entry was sent into competition number five in May last year and we featured Dusky Flycatcher, Natal Franklin and Collared Sunbird. And you, Maria Swart of Glenwood, Durban, got them all right. Congratulations, you're off to the Okavango. Well done, you'll soon be taking to the skies on an unforgettable birding safari. Okavango Swamps, truly a birder's paradise. We'll be in touch with you shortly to give you more details about your prize. And for die van jylle wat wel probeer het, maar nie gewen het, onthou, hierdie tyd volgende jaar, maak ons weer so. Keep trying. Well, now that the excitement of the Botswana bird trip draw is over, let's have a look at this evening's clues. And tonight we're again going north of our border, but this time to Zimbabwe a country with some amazing birds and a very important, unique bit of habitat, Brachystegia or Miombo woodland. And it's this area which is home to some rather special birds like Miombo rock thrush, Mashona hyliota, black-eared canary, Cabanus's bunting, and also various other species like silvery-cheeked hornbill and that real special, the Angola pitta. Zimbabwe is also home to a number of tropical specials which just don't make it across our borders in the north of our country. Bird number one was filmed at the Chinoy Pools National Park, northeast of Harare, and is also typical of Brachystegia woodland. It has a very characteristic behavior of busily searching around on the trunks of trees, climbing upwards, usually in a spiral, and then flying off to the next tree in a downward arc so that it lands near the base of the tree and starts the process all over again. Guy Gibbon from bird number two on a tea estate in the Hondi Valley, which is right on the eastern side of Zimbabwe at the foot of the Inyanga Highlands. It's a bird which is characteristically found in marshy or reed bed habitats and its bill shape should get you to the right family fairly quickly. Guy Gibbon filmed bird number three, again on the eastern side of Zimbabwe, but this time slightly further south, at a place called the Hironi Rasutu Junction. And it's a characteristic bird of the area, very common in that part of the world. And check out that wing color very carefully, because that is going to help you separate it from a very much more common species. Well, that's your lady draad of Fernand, so skryf hy antwoorde op a postcard neer, and steer it on the 5050 so for fast fra postbus 5486 Johannesburg 2000. Goedenavond en geniet jullie voor kijk. Diana Graham wanted to build a shrine to nature in her own garden simply because as an artist she felt it was important. Sometimes a visitors come and find something quite different. <laughs> Thank you. 
has, has any of the shrines made by men changed nature? Has it helped nature? On the whole, it's been bad for nature so far. So humans haven't had a good impact on nature so far. But, but you see, we didn't mean to. We didn't mean to have a bad impact. It's, it's, it's something that we've had to face in the last 300 years. We didn't realize what we were doing. And now we do realize it. So there's no reason why we shouldn't, shouldn't get it right. that should have a good mood set for the rest of the week. Thank you for joining us tonight on SABC2. Until next Sunday, goodbye.